Hello and welcome to the seventh episode of Hammer Time. I just realized I made a mistake last time and said that the last episode was the fifth episode, but I was wrong, it was already the sixth episode. So I'm very, very happy that we are continuing a pace and even slightly faster than I originally anticipated. I have a wonderful show prepared for you today. Uh, what I wanna talk about today a little bit is something that we have touched upon on this show on regular occasions and I want to go a little bit deeper today. And as I said, I believe that very often we talk about the symptoms of what causes the perceived decline of the West, but not so often about the root causes. And today is another topic, another issue I want to talk about that I have identified or I believe that I have identified as a root cause. And as a kind of a little bit of a spoiler, it's about moral licensing. And I'll go into greater detail what this is, but I kind of want to start a little bit with the symptoms of this phenomenon and then I want to go into greater detail. But I think there's a lot in there that you'll find interesting and enjoy. So I want to begin today with Germany. And Germany is kind of as a major European nation will always have a special place in this show. And as many of you know, that there's a lot of worry currently in the world whether or not Germany is shifting too far to the right because the Alternative for Germany, the AFD, the Alternative for Deutschland, as it would say in the original German, is on the rise. There are local elections in German states in a, in a couple of weeks and it looks as if they could gain first place in at least two out of these elections. So there is a lot of discomfort uh, among the powers that are. So they try to, to shift the conversation and they kind of try to shift it into the expected direction, which is that everybody who disagrees with them is a fascist. Everybody who disagrees with them is a Nazi, but apparently there is some self-awareness that that alone is no longer gonna cut it, so they also try to come up with a more positive message. Uh, and that positive message is, you probably have guessed it, that. Diversity is, in fact, our strength. So a couple of major German companies have issued you know, public uh, billboards, uh, have, have paid you know, advertisement in newspapers, have paid for airtime. And one of the things they have, you can see it here on the screen, is this kind of couple of, of colorful squares. And it says, made in Germany, made by Vielfalt, which translated means made in Germany, made by diversity, right? So the idea that they try to convey is that Germany is not or has not been, because it's more and more becoming a has-been instead of a, a been, is it was not a leading industrial nation in the world because of what the Germans did, it was because it was such a diverse nation. And the more diverse Germany gets, the more migration, of course, that takes place, the more open the borders are, the more vielfalt, the more diversity there will be, and the more made in Germany there will be. Now, a cynic might say it depends on what they mean by made in Germany, right? If it is what happened in recent weeks and months, if we are talking about crime, uh, gang violence, gang rapes, and these kind of things, then it's probably true, right? It is now made in Germany, and it is indeed made by Vielfalt. But I think what these companies try to convey is the idea that German industrial prowess, that German innovation is in fact coming from, uh, from mass migration, from diversity. Another great picture they had is this idea that instead of Germany, or in, Do in German, Deutschland, it's under the hashtag Zusammenland. So it's no longer you know, Germany as, as, or Deutschland as country of the Germans, land of the Germans. It's now land of togetherness. And underneath it, it says, Vielfalt macht uns stark, which literally translates as diversity is our strength. Diversity makes us strong. So a very, a very odd thing. And again, this is a campaign that is financed by major German companies. And now you might say, well, we probably disagree a little bit with the main messaging, but isn't it awesome if German companies stand up and supposedly take the side of Germany? They say, you know, we are, we are careful, we care about the future of Germany, we care about the future of our country. It is important to us that we are a prosperous, innovative country. And, right, I mean, this might be something we all would agree with. This is something that seems worth of approval. Now, however, if we take a closer look at what these companies are actually doing, we see that German companies are actually leaving Germany. So there was a poll taken in the fall of 2023, and what it shows is that two out of three companies in Germany have at least partially relocated their operations abroad, or they consider doing so. 
A main reason, of course, are high energy prices, but it's also bureaucracy and it's also a lack of skilled workers. So apparently these companies, instead of pushing the government to deal with the actual problems they are facing, which are bureaucracy, which are lack of skilled labor, which are high energy prices, they invest all their PR energy in diversity, in kind of making a commitment to the left-wing causes of the day. Now, you might ask yourself, why would they do this? What would be the reason for companies to do this? And I think there is one very important thing that we have to be honest about, and that sometimes even the libertarian or pro-capitalism right is willing to ignore, which is companies themselves, they are profit-seeking, right? They don't really have an interest in defending uh, the, the, the free market, if you want. They're interested in the free market to get in, but they would like nothing more than to pull up the ladder and become a monopoly once they, they have the opportunity to do so. So this idea that, that every company is gonna staunch defender of capitalism is not entirely true. Now, another thing, of course, that they would prefer is if you have to serve a truly diverse base of consumers, that can be very difficult, right? Lots of people have different tastes, they have different preferences, they have different things they're looking for in their products. So if you have many different ideas and, and desires to satisfy, now that is very work and labor intensive. That is something that is very complex. But imagine for a second if you have only one consumer or if only have one party whose desires you have to satisfy and that party is the state. So in many ways, companies are more than happy and willing to collude with a more state-centered economic system because they know with whom they are dealing, right? They, they, they know the bureaucratic system, they know the legal system, and they don't have to take care of the pesky consumers who constantly want better products and they want them at a cheaper price and they want them you know, delivered the same day. So the consumer, which is a good thing in the past, right? This is why capitalism in a way does very often work is because consumers are very demanding. And usually they only give their approval, they only give their business to companies whom they feel are best positioned to satisfy their demands. But that, of course, can be very taxing, very exhausting for companies. So they would say, well, wouldn't it be much easier if we do what governments want? And in return, governments create regulations and those regulations make it more difficult for our potential competitors to enter the market. Companies who exist would love nothing more. And this is also true in Germany. So in Germany, the companies are simply making the bet of saying, if the current government is all in on diversity, is all in on mass migration, right? We jump on that, band, on that bandwagon because then we get benefits. We get, get ever closer to those who are in power. We get ever closer to the government, to the state. And this then can also benefit us intellectually. So this is another thing, right? We tend to believe that all companies hate regulation. Well, they hate regulation if it harms their business. They really love regulation if it harms their competitors. So what you then very often see is that companies try, and this is what we also mean by lobbying, right? Lobbying is not just lobbying for a free market, for a capitalist system. It's very often lobbying for a form of regulation that punishes the competition and benefits yourself where you then get exceptions, where you then get special treatment, and all these different kind of things. And I think this is also something that, of course, falls under the idea that is often mentioned of the kind of industrial military complex, that you then can, under certain conditions, carve out exceptions from the regulatory state for your company that then works like a, like a fortress wall that kind of makes the market share you have, that makes your quasi-monopolistic situation unassailable from any competitor. So I think this is something that's very important to keep in mind, that overall companies are not fans or permanent fans of the free market. For those of you who are more interested in kind of uh, uh, to delve more into this issue, right? this is an argument of somebody we talked about on the show in the past. This is the Joseph Schumpeterian argument. Kind of Schumpeter argued along several cultural factors and several other reasons why he believed that ultimately socialism will be victorious as a system is for that reason, says that at some point even the supposed defenders of the free market system will actually sign up to a state-centered system because it can, it can defend, it can benefit their quasi-monopolistic stance. But we'll talk more about this in the future. So you have on the one hand this commitment to diversity, this commitment to 
uh, to, to mass immigration. And then, of course, the other side of that coin is the fight against fascism that I already mentioned. So, and, and here I would, I would argue that the gloves are off, right? There's no longer a debate about whether there's right of center and left of center. There's left of center and everybody else who's not left of center is a fascist. And we see this in another campaign that is in, in the upcoming elections in Eastern Germany, right, that says, who votes for the alternative for Germany votes for Nazis. And racists, anti-Semites, and sexists are those who vote for the AFD. Now, notwithstanding the fact that in Germany currently, but I would argue all over Europe, that anti-Semitism has become much more a problem of the left than it has become a problem of the right, it is just one of the things that is being said, right? None of this is anchored in reality. None of this has anything to do with what's really going on. But you want to smear the other side as a fascist, you want to smear the other side as a Nazi, because that means you also don't have to engage with their actual policy positions. You don't have to engage with their actual programs because they're evil. And if you fight against evil, right, everything is allowed, everything is permitted. And why this is kind of, why this is the strategy, we'll come to in a second, because this is quite important. Because it's not just important in the supposed fight that the left has, is waging against, against the right. It is also important in understanding how they behave themselves. Now, the very influential German weekly, Der Spiegel, has also kind of a very interesting cover. And on this cover, you see uh, an AFD politician, Mr. Höcke. You see behind him, Ms. Le Pen from France, and then behind her, Donald Trump. And it has uh, the headline, the subheadline, how fascism begins. So it's absolutely clear. Whether you vote for the AFD in Germany, the national rally in France, or Donald Trump in the United States, you are a fascist. This is how it starts. You have to be very aware of this. And that a vote for a right-wing party, a vote for a right-of-center party, is a vote for fascism. This is the argument they try to make. What they try to do is to blackmail the voters, to blackmail the public into either retreating from the political discourse and the political world, or to blackmail them into voting for the left-wing party, for the left-of-center party. And we see this, right? We saw this with Joe Biden. We saw this during the European parliamentary elections. And we see it, of course, in the contemporary political discourse. But the irony is, as I said, this was a headline from Der Spiegel, right? He also argues that everyone who votes for a right-wing party is a Nazi, a fascist, a sexist, or you name it. But the very, very same newspaper just a couple of years ago, had itself to fight with serious accusations of anti-Semitism, because one of its columnists was ranked by the Simon Wiesenthal Center as one of the 10 leading anti-Semites in, in Europe. I had it said, and this was in 2013, that the vice director of the Simon Wiesenthal Center, Rabbi Abraham Cooper, has confirmed the accusations against the journalist Jakob Augstein, who also happens to be the adoptive son, if I remember correctly, um, of Rudolf Augstein, the founder of, of the magazine Der Spiegel. And he was you know, writing all these articles about how the Jews control everything and how Israel is, uh, is basically in charge of global politics and the usual anti-Semitic tropes that very often now come in the disguise of anti-Zionism, but are, as Martin Luther King once said, not that different from anti-Semitism. So it seems very often that the very same newspapers, the very same political side that likes to accuse others of anti-Semitism is absolutely blind to anti-Semitism within its own ranks. And I think this is true within the media establishment, but it's also true, of course, within the political establishment. And the reason for this, I believe, is for this kind of cognitive dissonance, I would say. So where you have, and by the way, similar instances happened at the Süddeutsche Zeitung, a German newspaper. It happened at the New York Times. So this is not something that's a one-off. This is something that happens on a regular basis. And you probably wonder and say, wait, how is this possible? We recently had a case with a New York Times journalist who was part of a WhatsApp group of, of Jewish academics. And then she doxed those people and their conversations to anti-Israel anti uh, anti groups. Right? And this person is still employed by the New York Times. So you would then wonder and say, oh, wait a moment, this is odd. Like, how can you have simultaneously a newspaper or media organizations that accuse the other side, at, you know, even at the smallest potential incidents, of being anti-Semites, of being racists, of being quasi-Nazis, Yet they seem to be entirely oblivious when something like that happens within their own, their own four walls, where something happens within their own institution. And I believe the answer we can find in this is um, described by media licensing, uh, so, sorry, by, by moral 
more licensing by the media and by others. And this is a term from uh, psycholo psychology that I believe is not getting the attention it deserves. Let me just read to you real quickly what the definition. More licensing is a cognitive bias which enables individuals to behave immorally without threatening their self-image of being a moral person. And what that means is that I can do things, I can do bad things, but I believe myself to be so inherently good that if I do something bad, it is not the same as if somebody else does something bad. And I think this is what you see happening in the media world, but elsewhere as well, and I'll come to this in a second. So if you constantly are on the watch for potential racism and anti-Semitism of somebody else, then you kind of get licensed to be a little bit anti-Semitic and a little bit racist yourself. Because you are fighting the good fight, aren't you? You're doing, you're doing the work, as it is being said, so therefore you can afford to hold positions you would never grant to the other side. And this is, by the way, I think not just true in the realm of anti-Semitism. It's not just true in the realm of, of racism. We see it in other areas as well. One example would be the area of environmentalism. There is one clip I want to show of John Kerry, who, after all, was the climate envoy of the current US administration, so somebody who supposedly was charged with raising awareness and making sure that we save the climate and identify and punish whoever would be a sinner against the new religion of climate. Let's take a look. You know, people who go to Davos to talk about climate change fly private. It seems like they don't want to make... Um, well, they actually, I've talked to them about it. They offset. They yeah. buy offsets, they offset, and they are working harder than most people I know to be able to try to affect this transition. Right. You know. You see? So... The people who take private jets to Davos to you know, hobnob at the World Economic Forum, they try harder than anybody else to do something about climate change. So therefore, they have every right to take a private jet. It makes absolute sense, right? If you work so hard to deny anybody else to use a car, to use a plane, you kind of deserve to use the occasional plane yourself, even in this case, a private plane. And I think this is the best, and I have more co coming in shortly, but this is a great example of what I mean by moral licensing. So they are not even, they're not denying that, I mean, John Kerry later on tried in a congressional hearing to deny that he uses a private jet because he doesn't own one, but his wife owns one. So how good of a defense that is, um, I'll let you be the judge of that. But you see exactly what I described before here. So you do something that you would identify as an unspeakable evil if the other side does it, but you can afford to do it because you're fighting against that evil, right? So there's, there's no reason for you to, to, to be self-critical or self-aware because you are using a private jet to fight against the use of private jets just by somebody else. And we have plenty of instances of this, whether it was Greta Thunberg, uh, Luisa Neubauer, there are plenty of activists in this realm who do the Black Lives Matter movement, right? Where you have people kind of doing precisely the things that they accuse the other side of. And I think that's the important point here. I think they're aware of that. And I think it, we, we would underestimate their intelligence to say, oh, they're, they're entirely not self-aware of this. They are aware of it. But they believe that they can do it because they fight the big fight. They fight the, the, the more important fight. It's a little bit like the, you know, like in communist socialist regimes, when you had the, the, the revolutionary class, right? It's the nomenclatura, when they, when they get all these imports from capitalist countries and they live better than anybody else, right? I think they made the same argument. They do so much work for the global revolution. They do so much work for the, the communist revolution, for the communist idea that they deserve to you know, not have to stand in bread lines, that they deserve to have, I don't know, you know some luxury goods from, from the West. So th this is, I think, a constant that, that we see, is, is this idea that if you give your life, supposedly, for the revolutionary cause, you can kind of live better than, than those who would live under your revolution, a revolutionary regime would be supposed to live. And I think this is something that we see happening quite a bit. Now, this is not just John Kerry. Another example would be Annalena Baerbock in Germany, right? A green foreign minister, a fighter against climate change, a fighter for feminist foreign policy. And what we found out was that after she was visiting 
a football game at the Euro Championship, she took a flight, if I remember correctly, from Frankfurt to Luxembourg. Now, for my American viewers, they would say, man, this is like a super short distance. And not only that, like not only did she take the flight, she took that flight at night, a time during which there was a flight ban that her own Green Party was demanding in the past. So this is again a perfect case. So the Greens go out there and say, people should not use airplanes, they should use an ideal bicycle, or if that's not possible, they should use the train. But when it comes to the Green Foreign Minister, well, then all bets are off because she's so important. Just like John Kerry, she does so much in this struggle, in this fight for a better world, that she, of course, can flout the rules that she makes for everybody else. The same, by the way, was true for the entire German government, don't forget. We currently have a left-wing, a left-leaning socialist green government in Germany, and they claim to be the ones most in tune with the environmental concerns, with climate concerns. And they would never do anything to harm the climate or to be hypocritical or to live or not live up to their own expectations. Well, as it turned out, they did quite a bit. During the European Championship, I mean, I know these days half a million euros doesn't seem much, but I think it's still a symptom, it's still important. Just the flights of federal government employees and politicians cost the German taxpayer over half a million euros. So, of course, they also didn't pay anything for the tickets. So, the same politicians who will accuse, you know, the, the German factory worker who wants to spend five days in Mallorca uh, or, you know, or, or a couple of days uh, at the Mediterranean in Italy, that they should make, they, sh they should vacation at home. It's not necessary to go somewhere else. Like, they fly around from one football game to another and charge the very people whom they want to deny any kind of pleasantness in their life to charge them half a million euros. And this gets, once again, exactly this kind of moral licensing because they do so much for the planet. They do so much for the world that they are simply not bound by the rules they make for others. And this is quite crucial. Because this is the distinction I think that we have to make when we, when we talk about the elites and let's say those who are not part of the elite. Because any society always has an, an, a, a, a layer of an elite class. But I think what is important is, okay, is this elite class willing, do they have the aspiration to enable a better life for those over whom they rule? Or do they actually believe that there is one set of standards for them and one set of standards for everybody else. And this is, I think, what the, the populist revolution is actually about. The populist revolution is, and we talked about this in previous shows, right? It still, I think, fits partially in the right-wing, left-wing category. Um, I do believe it's a, a little bit an, uh, also a phenomenon, we talked about this as well, the oikophobia, oikophilia phenomenon. But I think another important element of this is this idea that there are rules but some have to live by those rules and others don't. We talked about this last week, about the so-called two-tier policing currently in the United Kingdom, right? It's the same phenomenon. So there are certain rules that apply to certain groups, and then there are groups who can flaunt those rules, for whom those rules are not applicable. And this is what bothers people, and this is what they mean. This is what this anger against the elites, I believe, is truly about. It's not about that some people are richer than others. This has always been the case. It is not about that some have more power than others, because, let's be honest, that has also always been the case, and no right or left in government will any, will, will change this anytime soon. But the idea that in the eyes of the law, we are no longer the same. In the eyes of the police, we are not the same. That you can be treated differently because supposedly what you do harms the world so much that you need to be banned from doing it. Yet those who make those rules are automatically exempt from those rules. I think this is one of the key distinctions we have to make between when we talk about the elites and the non-elites, between the elites and the non-elites. Somebody who I find is very, very important in this, in, this, in this discussion is the British historian Tom Holland. And I think one of the most important, if not the most important thinker in the English-speaking world uh, at, this, at this point in time. Uh, also, I mean, if you listen to his wonderful Together with Dominic Sambrook uh, podcast, The Rest is History, I highly recommend it to anyone. I think it's one of the best podcasts out there. And I think he kind of gives us a very good glimpse into what this moral licensing also means for the political discourse. Because I talk now generally about this phenomenon, but it then depends on how great do you think the evil is you're supposedly fighting against. 
because you really become, as Nietzsche said, if you stare long, and long enough into the abyss, the abyss stares back into you. And there is a danger that you become what you propose that you're fighting. And I believe that, that Tom Holland kind of gives us a very good glimpse into what many on the left actually believe that they are fighting these days. Uh, and let's take a look at this short clip. And so we no longer needed the devil mm -hmm. because we have Hitler. Right. We no longer needed hell because we have Auschwitz. Mm -hmm. And so ever since, ever, since the, um, ever since the war, when most people in the West want to know what is right, what is good, mm -hmm. they look at the Nazis and they do whatever the, the opposite to what the Nazis did. Right. I would add to the statement by Tom Holland that it's the opposite of whatever they claim that the Nazis did or that the Nazis would do. But I think he makes a very important observation here. So the argument very often is that the world has become more secular, that we have become a quasi-atheistic society. But I don't think this is entirely true. I think Tom Holland is correct that, that we have just shifted kind of the, the, the same rejection, if you want, or, or the fear of hell, the, the fear of Satan, we've just kind of replaced it with a, a fear of, of Nazism, of Hitler, and, and, and of, of Auschwitz. And to project, of course, these things onto your political opponent, to say that you, know, you are just like the Nazis, as we said at the beginning of today's show, this is just like what the fascists do, is just a secular version, or an, an atheist version, if you want, of 200 years back, if somebody said, oh, you're in league with the devil, right? you're doing the work of, of, of the Antichrist. It's, it's more a religious sentiment, a religious feeling, than it is an actual political rational argument. But I believe it has the same power. So just as in the past somebody was waving the Bible at you, right? nowadays they wave, they throw Hitler at you. And I think Holland knows this, and he makes precisely this kind of argument uh, in another clip I want to show to you. But we don't need Christianity anymore. We've got Hitler, we've got the Nazis. And that has been a, a, a constant, really since the 60s, that you know, fascist, Hitler, Nazi, is, 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 is the ultimate insult. And that is true, right? That's the ultimate insult, which is why it is used in the political discourse, in Germany, in the United States and elsewhere. Right? The, the idea is, if it's, it's the, the highest imagination of horror are the Nazis, is fascism. And this might be justified, right? The point is not to say that this is not justified. But of course, what this means, and this goes back to the moral licensing problem, this is why I want to connect those two things. If I accuse the other side of the most horrible things imaginable, then at some point I will take the license to do what I accuse the other side of in order to prevent the other side from coming to power. And I think that's the actual true danger. I think the likelihood, I don't think the Republicans are fascists. I don't think the AFD in Germany are fascists. I don't think that Nigel Farage in the UK is a fascist. I don't think that the conservatives in Canada are fascists. But what I do believe is that Many on the left do believe this because it is their new religion. And every religion, not every religion, but most religions, need an equivalent of heaven and hell. Right? They, they need this, this essential existential struggle. So they project the need for the struggle on the other side. They project it on their political opponent. But then it's no longer a political discourse. Then it's no longer a debate. Um, a, a clash of different ideas for the common good. Like as the saying in the United Kingdom once went that, it's Her Majesty's loyal opposition. So you might have one party in power, you have the other party in opposition, but both of them have the same goals. Both of them want to benefit the country. They just disagree on how to get there. No, no, this is now perceived as being a struggle of good versus evil. And if the other side is truly evil, well, then you cannot be bound by anything, right? There cannot be some, some legal ties that hold you back. There cannot be some kind of, of procedural rules that would prevent you from fighting this evil that might destroy the world if it comes to power. And we saw this in the past, right? If you think about the way, for example, how the news media has reacted to Donald Trump. And we can have long conversations about the failures, the issues with Donald Trump. There is a lot. This is not a, a perfect man. This is a flawed man. But the argument is, and this is the argument that is being made, that if he wins an election, there never will be elections again. Now, we all know that this is not true, right? Or at least a rational human being knows that that is not true. But that's the argument that's being made, because he's a fascist. 
He's the, he's the orange devil. He's orange Hitler. And therefore, every means necessary must be allowed in order to prevent him from coming to power. As Kagan, as Robert Kagan wrote in the Washington Post a couple of weeks ago, that by legal or illegal means. And that truly is the trouble. Because very often, I think, we try to discuss something in political terms which actually falls into a, a quasi-religious category. These are, these are theological struggles, I would argue, much more than political struggles. And if we want to make the historical comparison, right, we do see that the idea that, a small, that evil is permissible if it is used to prevent a greater evil, this, interestingly enough, is the argument that very often was made by no other than the Nazis themselves. Right? We have speeches by Heinrich Himmler, his, his personal speech, where he's very well aware of the fact that the Holocaust, that genocide is a bad thing, right? that it's a horrible thing, a horrible crime. But he says, we have to do it in order to prevent even worse crimes from happening down the road. When Solzhenitsyn wrote about the Gulag, when he wrote about the Bolsheviks, yes, they made the same argument. Right? They said they could keep a clear mind while committing mass murder because they could justify it to themselves in the name of a supposed greater good. And this is, I think, something that we see at least in its first steps in our contemporary political discourse as well. That through the accusation of the other side of being Nazis, of being like Hitler, of being fascists, they create for themselves the license to use potential fascistic methods to prevent the other side from ever gaining power. And we see this, right? We see it in the crackdown on social media. We see it in the attempts in Germany to ban uh, newspapers, to ban certain media outlets. So this is happening in real time. Now, I would be as critical of this if it would happen from the other side, but it's not at the moment. We had a, there was recently a, a study done about artificial intelligence, about large uh, language models, right? And so they have a strong left-leaning bias. So many, both within our economy, within the culture, within media, they see themselves as part of this existential struggle. They see themselves as part of this supposed fight against Nazism, against fascism. And this is the problem, because if you honestly believe that the other side is Hitler reincarnate, there is nothing that will stop you from the methods. There is nothing that will stop you from... Uh, or they, it's hard to make an argument that any kind of, of, of rules apply to you to stop you from trying to prevent it. And we see this in another area as well. As I said, this is a quasi-theological struggle, not a political struggle. And you see this in the current campaign by Kamala Harris, right? the Joy campaign. Um, well, I would argue that it's all facts, no feelings. And this is a headline from Rolling Stone magazine. I mean, not saying probably not the most uh, you know, renowned publication, but I think the headline captured it so nice. So I read it too. Why Kamala Harris' new politics of joy is the best way to fight fascism. Right? So they say it out loud. So I just want to make clear that this is not, maybe it's a little bit, but this is not just projection from my side on the other side to say, oh, you know, they accuse you of being a fascist and now Ralph is just turning it upside down and accuses them of fasc fascism. No, they openly say it. Right? So this is, a, this is a campaign, once again, that says, and this is also a reason why they don't ask Kamala Harris many policy questions. Because this is not about retirement age, about social security. No, no, no. This is about the fight against fascism. And their quote unquote joy campaign, right, is part of this struggle against, against fascism. Of course, the problem with this is once you get caught up in this existential struggle, it also absolves you very much from knowing anything. And I'll give you one example for this. Or let me rephrase this. It kind of, you then start to phrase everything, as Tom Holland said in that clip I played to you before. Right? So you look at something and then you ask yourself, okay, what would the Nazis do? And then you would do the opposite. So you look at migration policy and you say, hmm, would the Nazis be for open borders or would they be for closed borders? Well, they probably would be for closed borders, therefore I'm against closed borders. Like, would the, the Nazis be for, for, for uh, natalist policies or non-natalist policies? They probably would be for natalist policies, so I'm against that. Now, I say probably because I do believe, and we're going to have a, a known segment, a known show dedicated to this in the upcoming weeks, that a lot of the supposed positions of fascism and Nazism um, are being abused and are, are not what they actually were. It's kind of, again, just a form of projection. Because you could very much make the claim that environmentalism 
was something that in some areas the fascists were quite keen about, right? You could argue that in many areas the idea of the welfare state was something the fascists, definitely the national socialists, were very keen about. So I'm, I'm not arguing here that this projection is, is objectively accurate, but it is what's taking place, right? And you see this in the public debate. Oh, you're for closed borders, you're a Nazi. You're against mass migration, you're a Nazi. You're for law and order, you're a Nazi. Objectively, it might not be true, but this is how it is perceived. This is how it is felt on the other side of the aisle. And as I said, it gives you an also license to be uninformed, because if I'm fighting the good fight against evil, what are details? Details can just get in the way. And just one example that I find also kind of funny from New York and the uh, American mayor, Eric Adams, um, who was at an event um, about for, for Indian communities and, and uh, the Indian community in the United States. And during his speech, he three times confuses India with Pakistan. Now, anybody who knows anything about the world knows that, you know, I guess most people from India would take offense as being called uh, Pakistani, and most Pakistanis probably would take offense at being called Indians. And especially somebody, somebody who is so tied to the left-wing worldview, like New York City Mayor Eric Adams, you would suppose that he knows that, right? That he's aware of this. But as I said, ah, it ups, like, He's on the right side. He, he is pro-diversity. So what the actual diversity is, is of secondary concern. It's not really something that matters anymore. So Indians, Pakistanis, who cares? No, doesn't matter as long as it is a statement pro-diversity. It also, however, allows you to kind of hide or be completely blind to your own authoritarian tendencies. Here's a picture of Joe Biden, a speech he held at uh, Liberty Hall in Philadelphia. I mean, this is why I say you have to watch this on, on, on YouTube so that you can see the picture. But if you look at this, if you would have a few eagles in the background, this could be out of 1930s Germany. So again, the iconography here is very much kind of taken, I would say, out of a fascist playbook. But since Joe Biden at this event was speaking against fascists, he could use fascist imaginary to do so. It also allows you to kind of hide other authoritarian tendencies as well. If we do take a look at some of the policy points that Kamala Harris is making, like a most recent one on what justifiably critics call a form of quasi-communism, right? this idea that, that the government will take care of what fair prices are, that she's going to stand up against price gouging, that, uh, you know, because all the supermarkets and the grocery stores have colluded against, uh, against, against customers, even though price margins in this area are very small, right? This idea that the state, the government, will set quote-unquote fair prices. The government will decide what fair prices are, right? So this, again, this, this is something that is, in essence, authoritarian, right? If, if the government walks up to a company and says, well, this is what we allow you to charge. And of course, then the company is saying, listen, I can charge what you tell me, but I have to buy, you know, I have to buy energy, I have to buy input goods as well, and they charge me more so I cannot, I cannot produce at the price that you want me to. So then, of course, the state will go to these other companies as well and say, okay, here's what you can charge this other company for the input goods. So you then all of a sudden would end up, more or less, at a socialist, quasi-communist economy because it's a trickle-down effect. If you try to control prices in one significant sector of the economy, you will end up of having to control prices in ever more sectors of the economy, which, as we know, historically never worked and never led to the kind of outcome that one would hope. And as I said, this is part of this of this uh, phenomenon of, of moral licensing, because it, it gives you the authority to do things that you would accuse the other side of doing, but since you're fighting against the other side, you have liberty to do so. It goes back to my original example of John Kerry and the private jet, right? You, you can simultaneously say that using a private jet is the worst form of sin, is the worst form of, of crime against the climate, but then you can use it yourself because you do it in the name of fighting against climate change. And I think this is a lot what underlies our contemporary political discourse and the, the contemporary political debate that we are having. Um, and as I said originally, this is in many areas, this is more theological than a, than a purely political discourse. A lot of this, I think, can be understood much better if we look at it from this emotional viewpoint than if we think that this is a, actually a, a fight, a debate, about policy proposals. 
And they do know this, I think, particularly the smarter politicians on the left, they know this. So what they will try to do, if we look at the elections that are coming up in Austria, in Germany, and in the United States, right, they don't want a debate about the issues. Because these issues are fickle, right? And very often, I would argue, at least in some areas, the policy positions of the right are very much in tune with the majority of the population. So they want to avoid these conversations and say, forget about the policies, forget about the nitty gritty of, of administrating a country of bureaucracy and focus on the bigger picture, which is our fight against fascism. And if you don't side with us, you are siding with the fascism. And most people don't have the time, because they have jobs, they have family, they have other things to do, to engage in great details with political programs. So they, of course, when they vote, they will be successfully blackmailed, emotionally blackmailed, into either not going to vote in the first place or to vote for the left-leaning party, because nobody wants to be a fascist, right? They don't want to go home. They don't want to turn on the TV. They don't want to open the newspaper and say, if you voted for the right of center party, that makes you a fascist, because they, justifiably so, feel as if that media is speaking to them. It is accusing them of being a fascist. And this is one of the struggles that I think we have to face. And I'm looking forward to next week when we will have episode eight of Hammer Time.